Welcome to episode 137 of Gun Guy Radio. This is a podcast that shines a positive light on the firearms lifestyle. I'm your host, Chick Challen, and this is your weekly dose of positive firearms talk without the politics. Well, just a few announcements uh, before we get going here. Well, first of all, I have a guest, I guess. <laughs> I'll introduce you, Paul. Paul Levy, special guest, Brown Owls product uh, category manager. Hey, Paul. Hey, Jake. Good to be here. So, yeah, let's talk about uh, Chicagoland listeners' attention. Uh, next weekend, uh, September 27th, is a bullpup shoot here in Waterman, Illinois. So, uh, all-day event for the family. It's Saturday, September 27th. Uh, there's also going to be a zombie shoot event where you can bring your own competition rig for that. And I heard there also might be some full auto guns out there for uh, you guys to pay to shoot. So uh, I'll be there. Several of the other farms, radio network personalities will be there. So it would be cool to you know shake your hand, see you there. So uh, put that on your calendar, September 27th. And then uh, coming up in October um, is a Tough Mudder event for Dallas area uh, listeners, Dallas, Texas. Uh, Jack and Carol of our Fat to Fit podcast will be doing a Tough Mudder running with the Firearms Radio Network uh, gun runner team. And uh, for more info, you can contact uh, Carol over at uh, Carol at Fat to Fit. Uh, hq.com and they're also doing a listener meetup uh, that I think it's a Friday it's um let's see here the it's October 4th is the Tough Mudder I believe it's a Friday before it at PF Chang's in Dallas Texas more info in the show notes for that that's going to be at 10 p.m. Uh, the listener meetup so uh, stay tuned for more and uh you can now contribute to the Farms Radio Network and uh, Gun Guy Radio by shopping Amazon. So just click on the Amazon affiliate link before your next shopping trip, and a small portion of that goes back to the network. So let's get into the main topic here. So Rock Castle, Rock Castle 3-Gun Pro-Am recap, and we're going to talk a little bit about the gear here. Paul, so uh, why don't you start us off with uh, what what is Rock Castle Three Gun Pro Am? Okay, uh, well it's a it's a professional amateur three gun match uh, held every year uh, at Rock Castle Shooting Center in Kentucky. Um, so you got a good mix of pro shooters, uh, Jerry Mikulik, all of those of his big names, um, and then the amateur side. That's where I fall, and uh, everybody else has a chance to shoot on fairly similar stages. They did it a bit different this year. But uh, you get some really cool stages. I believe it was seven total. Um, uh, not too challenging, but then again, it wasn't just some simple, you know, plinking stages either. Um, so it's a good mix of, of, uh, of uh, I guess, difficulty, and uh, it's easy to step into as well. Uh, and there was about 500 or more shooters there. It was, it's a big event. I believe it's one of the biggest uh, three-gun competitions in the country. Uh, you got vendors that show up uh, that are there selling product. Uh, there's one vendor doing quite well. I can't recall who it was. They're selling ammo, primers, reloaded components out of their semi trailer. Uh, our friends uh, over there at DSG Arms, they're selling stuff. Uh, a lot of good vendors there. Uh, and you get to meet people in the industry, too. Uh, you get to meet people that uh, you, you see releasing products or talk about products. Uh, so you can meet the owners or the creators of. Uh, of uh, the stuff you got on your gun and get their input on why they did certain things uh, and give them your feedback too. Uh, hopefully not telling them why, you're, why their stuff stinks, but uh, it, it's kind of a great uh, kind of little meetup uh, for the industry. Very cool. Yeah, I've heard uh, Rock Castle described as America's ultimate shooting sports resort. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's big. It's, it used to be... Uh, a golf course. Of course, it's in uh, western Kentucky, so you got this hilly, rolling countryside. Uh, there's a resort that's up on the top of the hill, or the lodge, which you drive up to. Um, and it's an old hotel uh, with a restaurant, and that's where everybody meets up uh, for the prize table and announcements up there. Um, but then the, the courses themselves, or the stages, they're all throughout this old golf course or in the timber. Uh, there's a uh, Sporting clays area too, so you get a good mix of uh, of terrain, and then it also caters towards uh, whatever firearms you're shooting. So if it's a shotgun heavy stage, uh, it's going to be over by a sporting clay. It's going to be open. Uh, there's 
almost timber walk stages where they're it's heavily wooded and, and that sort of thing. But there's also distance. I believe the longest the amateur shot out to was about 250 or so. Wow. I think the pro shot, they, they shot a little bit further than that. They shot a little over 300. Um, but in years past, it's it's gotten up to that 300 or so. So you should know where your rifle zeroed prior to going. I would recommend that. Uh, but uh, it, it's a pretty fun match, and everybody was great. Uh, uh, squad 5, uh, whose squad I was on, all great guys. Uh, it, it's great for us because we get to meet uh, the actual shooters, people using the products we sell, and we get to hear feedback about the good stuff we do and the stuff we do wrong. And It's, it's a good opportunity for us to fix things. Uh, so it's on an old golf course. Did they keep a fleet of golf carts so you can go to, around <laughs> to the different stages? They actually do. Uh, they have golf carts. Um, they didn't rent them this year because it's so spread out is that the golf carts just don't get you to the stages quickly or in time. Uh, there's Although it was pretty, it was very well run this year, actually. I've been to a few three-gun matches, and what you run into with that number of people is one squad can really slow everything up. But right. they timed it so each each stage was far enough apart. You had time to rest, relax, go back to the hotel if you wanted. Uh, you can go shoot the side matches where nobody really got backed up. So uh, it went smoothly. We shot, I think we shot probably every stage either on time or early, which is, that's probably the first time I've ever done that at a three-gun match. Uh, and it was also, that was nice because it was probably 95 degrees there and humid. Uh, so I'm glad, I'm glad things went smoothly. So, yeah, I saw last year there was over 500 shooters there, almost 600 yeah. shooters there last year, and they said said it was a pretty even split between pro and amateurs, about mm -hmm. 250 or, well, give or take, you know, for each. Did you see that there this year? About yep. the same? It, was, it was about the same. Um, I know there was about two, 250 on the amateur because when I was looking at the rankings, I was making sure not to be 250. <laughs> uh, and I believe on the pro side it was about that same same amount. Um, and the good thing, too, with that many shooters, though, you think, uh, well, you're just not going to get any prizes. The amateur, it, let me step back there. Uh, so there's 250 shooters, and, of course, the top guys are going to get some prizes. Well, the uh, the prize table for amateur is actually random. Uh, so you can place 200th and still get a, a fire. You can win a firearm. Um, and everybody does win something. Uh, you'll get something valued. I, I believe it's at least... $150 or so. Uh, I got a gift card to one online shop for $100 and just bullets. Really? Everyone? Um, average of that? Everybody, uh, yeah. And I was picked almost last. <laughs> I, was, I was standing at the price table quite late. Um, but uh, the, And then the pro side, that's done in order of uh, where you finish. So the, the top guys will get a pick, uh, and then it goes down the line. But even then, uh, companies like, well, ourselves and then other industry partners will pitch in for products to give away. Uh, so you'll see a good assortment of products uh, up for grabs there. So, like, what kind of stuff did you, the top pro guys get? The top pro guys get complete rifles or handguns. Same with the amateur. The, the top uh, 15 people or so on the amateur get firearms. Oh, really? And probably the top 30 or so, I'd guess, on the pro side get firearms. Um Actually, uh, a coworker of mine got a uh, pair ordnance uh, Black Ops 45, wow. and he placed like five spots ahead of me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I got I got a Brownells magazine and a gift card, and he got a pistol. So that's how that works. <laughs> it's a random draw, though. Um, so if you want to, if you're really shooting, you know, to place high and get a good prize, you want to shoot pro. If you're new to it, you're you're obviously shooting amateur, and you're going there more for fun. And that's that's where the random draw comes in. <laughs> Very cool. So what kind of atmosphere is there like when you roll up uh, the first day? How many days is this event? Um, the amateur shoot takes place Friday and Saturday. And offhand, I don't even remember. This was about August 20th or so. Um, but uh, it's always in kind of the middle of August, so keep an eye out for it uh, later this year. Usually Brian, you know, is that form. They have a lot of updates early on. But as far as the atmosphere, it was it was 95. <laughs> um and it, it's just kind of a, I wouldn't call it festive, but everybody's intermingling. And people aren't afraid to talk to each other, ask about gear and that type of thing. Uh, stepping back to the days, I'm sorry. Um, Friday, Saturday for amateur, and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday for the pro. Pro shooters only shoot, I believe, like two or three stages per day. Uh, they keep that spread out uh, for whatever reasons. Um, so if you shoot pro, you will stay all day Sunday, shoot, and then do prize table that evening. 
Uh, Saturday evening is the amateur prize table. So if you're shooting amateur, you can travel there Thursday, get registered Thursday evening, shoot Friday, Saturday, and then take off Saturday night or leave Sunday morning. So it's really not a big inconvenience as far as work goes if you live in the, the Midwest or even on the East Coast. Did I did I see that there was a, actually a, another three-gun match shot the previous weekend there? Yeah, they shot uh, the week before, and I think it was a DPMS-sponsored match, and I don't yeah. know the details on that one. The uh, I think it was a uh, Midwest Regional match okay. by DPMS. Okay. So I guess some of the guys were there all week, some of the pro guys maybe? Yeah, some of the pro guys will go, well, some of these pro guys, they'll just go all summer um, and just cruise around the country and check out different matches. So they got that's well that's what they do so they they get that uh, benefit but uh, yeah they also sponsor some other or not sponsor but they also host a variety of uh, three gun matches there are other matches I think there's been just dedicated shotgun matches there all sorts of stuff so it's it's, it's obviously a great place for for shooting matches because it's so big uh, it's got the hotel on site so you can do a lot of things so you said side matches were there too did you check any of those out. Uh, I didn't shoot any of them myself. Um, they had a AAC was there, our good friends there, Derek Smith. I saw him work in that booth, um, and they were letting people shoot uh, suppressed. Uh, I believe they had handguns, and they had a submachine gun, uh, just kind of plinking away. You basically get a magazine or two, um, so you can shoot stuff. You know, not everybody gets to shoot all the time. Um, I believe there was another side match where they had a PKM, and they were shooting out at distance. Cool. Uh, that, that looked pretty cool. Um, and in years past, there was a cave. They didn't do it this year because I think there's an endangered bat or something living in it, <laughs> uh, so they can't shoot it in anymore. But in years past, it was great because you'd, you'd go down there, I think it was a surefire stage, and you'd actually go through this cave, walk through it, and engage targets as you went. Uh, you'd have to light it up with your surefire light, identify the target, shoot. There were no shoot targets, too. Uh, so it was, it was a pretty fun stage. But, yeah, now I don't think they do that one anymore. Were the targets bats? <laughs> uh, not when I did it, so I, I don't know who found the endangered bats, but that kind of shut that down. Man, I tell you what. So, um, yeah, it, it seems like uh, there's lots of cool stuff going on there. Uh, oh, yeah. it says uh, it says there is a shooting gallery complete with Tannerite. Did you see any of that? Oh, I missed out on that one. I, oh. <laughs> Yeah, the explosives are always fun. Uh, they're, they're probably doing it on this area. There wasn't a stage there for the amateur this year, but uh, they kind of have like an Old West town set up. There's oh, a, they do. That's there's awesome. a, there's It basically looks like a, a bunch of storefronts, and then you can shoot targets down into this valley through the storefronts. So that's kind of So that's probably where it was at. Um, so they do a lot. Of, they obviously do some cowboy action stuff there also. Um so that range is pretty cool and is, is set up great for that type of stuff. And I should say the ROs, uh, they did a great job at this match, uh, at least everyone we interacted with, because they, they're basically volunteering, and they work the whole weekend, even though it's 95-some degrees and humid. Uh, it uh, they, they do great, and they're definitely appreciated. Any match you go to where you got ROs, you should uh, obviously have ROs, but you should definitely thank them. Uh, they do great work. So tell us about some of the stages there you experienced. No, okay. Um, there was one stage that frustrated a few people because uh, it was just uh, the the time limit didn't allow. It was it was tough to squeeze in all the targets. Um, the time limit for every stage was a hundred seconds, so you have to engage everything uh, prior. So, so there is a time limit. So this is a little yeah. different for some people that have shot USPSA or. IU. Yeah, maybe I should just explain how it's set up first and and go into sure. the different uh, classes and then the the rules. Um, you you have the various targets. Of course, it's three guns, so you may have designated targets. You're supposed to engage with a pistol, handgun, or shotgun. You can only do it in certain areas. You're not allowed to go outside of those areas. Very similar to other uh, styles of competition. Um, the uh, targets are scored similar to, to other pistol sports where alpha one hit is uh, is good or you can hit it two anywhere. Usually everybody sh sprays two or more at, at the pistol targets. Um, and then uh, your designated other targets, uh, rifle, shotgun. Um, and you're given, basically it's time. So at the start, you'll hear the buzzer and then you'll start engaging targets. You have 100 seconds then to engage all the targets 
And then if you don't, it, it times out, and any targets you don't engage, they tally up your penalties for not hitting them or shooting the wrong targets and that sort of thing. So your score is actually a, your time plus any penalties. Um, so some, some targets are, uh, you can only engage like this target with a pistol. And yes. If, yes. You and shoot, then, if you shoot it with a rifle or a shotgun, you get dinged for yeah, it. But it's, it's usually fairly obvious, obvious especially mm -hmm. on the amateur stages. They're different shapes, they're different styles. Um, the pistol targets are clearly, uh, especially when they're steel, they'll usually be a circle or something like that and the shotgun will be square. So it's pretty obvious, and they're also spread out usually, so they're not in the same location. So that's really not an issue people have, at least okay. at this match. It's pretty straightforward. Um, so that I don't see people just running into that anyways. It, it's usually pretty clearly defined. Yeah. Okay, very cool. So, um, so yeah, tell us about some of the stages. Okay. Um, so there's the, there's the various stages anyways. Um, one particular one, uh, you had to, they had six steel uh, plates set up. They're about, oh, two feet, two by three feet, pretty large, but they're at 40, 50 yards, and you had to engage them with your shotgun uh, with slugs. So you had to engage those, and then you ground your shotgun, you put it in a barrel. Um, here's another thing that everybody has to keep in mind is when you ground the gun, it has to be on safe. Uh, or completely empty. Uh, same with the handgun. So if you're shooting your 1911, you're shooting and you need to ground it somewhere before you go to your rifle, it has to be on safe. Or if you have a Glock, you can just set it down. It's kind of a little, little competition quirk. <laughs> Since it's technically on safe, you can just set your lock down, whereas the 1911, you got your extra step of making sure you engage the safety. If you don't engage the safety on, say, any, any firearm you ground, you'll get a stage disqualification. Oh, wow. So you basically lose your score. So they're very strict, uh, and this is any three-gun match I've been to. They're usually quite strict on, on safety. Uh, back to the stage. Uh, so you engage those targets with your uh, your shotgun. Uh, you ground that, and then uh, you pick up your rifle, and you can choose your shooting position. You can shoot prone, kneeling, standing, and you had to engage these steel poppers at varying distances. You had 100, 150, and then a little over 200. And they don't tell you the range, although some guy in your squad has a range finder and tells everyone. Uh, but uh, so I, on that particular stage, I went prone, shot those. Then they have you run over to the next area where you have to engage those same targets, just a slightly different view. Uh, once you engage those with the rifle, ground your rifle, and then you draw your pistol, which you've had on yourself this whole time holstered. Draw your pistol and then shoot those same steel targets you're shooting with the uh, the slug. Uh, and at that point, they're still pretty far. They're uh, 40 yards or so with a pistol. And that, that, that was tough for a lot of people, shooting that, that distance. And plus, you get pretty amped up when you're shooting. You, you just got done shooting two guns. You're trying to be as fast as you can. Then you got to draw, shoot your pistol, and keep sight alignment, sight picture, and it's tough. <laughs> so that's one stage. That's a, that's a good example of throwing in all three guns and making a true three-gun. Um, right. So if you're like running up on your time limit, is it sometimes better just to? Do you have to stop when you hit your time limit, or can you keep going and take a penalty for going? Uh, up? yeah, you need to stop. <laughs> okay. Once the time goes, actually on that stage, I shot my last round just like a split second after the buzzer went off. It's not like that's a bad thing, but the RO wants you to stop because anything okay. after that, it, it doesn't matter. So you're you have to, you have to stop. Okay. Yeah. It, it, you have to stop also because they needed to score what you did and didn't hit. So if you continue to shoot, oh, you're not going to be able to tell what you <laughs> did and didn't hit. So there's that, yeah. Um, and also, there's different people that uh, just try and figure out, well, and, and you want to keep this in mind when you're shooting, especially if you have trouble. Say you're shooting at that 200-yard target and you're not hitting it and you're just dumping rounds, five rounds, ten rounds all of a sudden, you need to decide, okay, I'm just going to take the penalty, I'm not hitting that, and just move on. So that factors in, so you got to keep that keep that in the back of your head when you're shooting. Uh, on that stage, I actually went to the kneeling on the second rifle set and started shooting, and I just wasn't comfortable. And maybe I should have just moved on, but I just went prone instead and just made sure I hit him and then kept going. But then that just added a bit more time. So should have gone prone to start with, but then again, do I leave and just get up and shoot the pistol? That's something you gotta. That's something you gotta decide right there in the moment. Right. So, so were were all the stages? Uh, uh, you said a hundred seconds. 
Right. Yeah, all stages were 100 seconds. Uh, some stages took 40 seconds for most people to complete. Some, a lot of people timed out, like on that one, or they took 90 seconds. It, it varied. And not all stages were all three guns either. Uh, some stages, there was a shotgun-only stage where you start out and you shoot clays. Uh, you shoot five clays, then you shoot... So right if you shoot aerial targets, you have to go and shoot ground targets and then switch to buckshot on some and engage these poppers at 40 yards with buckshot. So you got to think about how how am I operating this shotgun, how is it loading, what round's in there right now, that type of thing. Um, so that, w that was a pretty fun one. And it's kind of fun watching three-gun shooters try and shoot clays because they're not all... Yeah. <laughs> they're not all going to the trap range. Um, and then there's some that are heavy, uh, just handgun. There's some that are handgun rifle only, hum some that are handgun shotgun. This particular event this year was fairly heavy on the shotgun. I think that's probably due to uh, ammo just being cheaper for shotgun, and they didn't want to make this an event that just wasn't affordable for people. So that's probably one way, one reason they relied heavily on the shotgun. And also the shotgun's just challenging because you gotta, yeah, I, you oh, gotta get, <laughs> we gotta, you gotta get good at reloading. Um, and now there's, there's so many guys. That's what really separates some of the good shooters or makes up a lot of time is. If you can throw those shells in quick, or if you're fumbling there, just doing one at a time, it's going to really show. Men from the boys, yeah, yeah. I, I would have been terrible if it was shotgun yeah. heavy. <laughs> yeah. Well, and really, with the, we'll get into the gear in a bit, but the, the loaders that are out there now, you can buy some basic loaders that can make it really easy if you just practice. Um, get some dummy shells and just practice, like the week or two before. I'm terrible about practicing much ahead of time, but the week or two before I was practicing with dummies in the basement, just getting them in there so I'm comfortable, I know where the shotgun is, and, and get a feel for the, uh, the lo how it's loading. Uh, but, uh, yeah, some guys you could tell they didn't either zero their guns or <laughs> see if guns were functioning before they left. Uh, yeah, so some stuff can get ugly. And it, it's not exactly a high round count event, but it's just... Uh, I don't know if it's the stress or what, but you see a lot of people either not manipulate the firearms properly or they just go down just because they weren't uh, keeping tabs on them. So you see a variety of things. So you definitely need to know your firearms. It's a good test of that anyways, just getting getting muscle memory down and making sure you're shooting right. So, yeah, what was your uh, favorite uh, part of the weekend then? Um, Favorite part of the weekend? I... I really like the rifle heavy stages. I really enjoy shooting rifles, so those those were great. Uh, but uh, probably the favorite part was the squad uh, interacting with those guys because you, you get a you, you're waiting for the next stage to start or you're resetting targets uh, so the next shooter can go and you're just BSing with these guys and these are people you never met before but you all have one thing in common and that's an interest in guns. So that, that was really in any three gun match that's really been the case. So um, if well, you're worried, really, yeah, if really, you're, really, really <laughs> match you go to. Yeah, that's a great. If you're worried about going to three gun match, I was, I was hesitant about going to my first one, uh, just because you don't feel like you're gonna know anything, you're not prepared. But really, everybody was in that same position, and everybody helps out. So it's not if you're, if your shotgun goes down, somebody will lend you their shotgun. If something breaks, they'll help you out. They'll help you fix it. So that's a great thing about these events, anyways. And I'm sure any every shooting event's like that, but. Uh, yeah, for, for sure, yeah. It's always a great bunch of guys, so if you haven't yeah. gone to any competition, don't hesitate, yeah. for sure. Yeah. My my first three gun, I uh, I didn't have, I don't think I had any shell holders at all. And <laughs> Doing the gonna, cargo pocket reload? I was going to do the cargo pocket reload, and but there was a really cool guy there that he had some extra shell hold, holders, so I, you know, he let me use those, and it was great, so. Yeah, and at, uh, at the previous match I went to this year, CMMG, uh, one of the stages that was shotgun heavy, they knew people weren't going to have enough shell loaders, so I actually had to borrow shell loaders uh, at the match, which was nice, and that was well thought out. Um, but yeah, any match you go to, if it's three guns gear heavy, so go with what you have or just do the best you can. People will help you out or tell you what you can do better on, so it's you should never worry about... Right. Well, and sometimes it may be better going that way because then you yeah. can see what works and buy the yeah. buy, maybe buy the right gear the first time instead yeah. of buying stuff that uh, uh, might not work yeah. for you. Um, the big thing, uh, 
if you're going to go to a three-gun match, the big things I would recommend is make sure you can handle the gun safely. You don't want to get disqualified. Um, it, it, it's happened to a lot of good shooters uh, for doing silly things, but you just want to you want to be able to have confidence in how you handle the gun, and people around you want to have confidence in you handling the gun. Uh, so know your guns, how they operate. Um, that's a that's a big one. Um, and then just listen to the ROs. They'll give you direction on when to load. And I'm still, I will ask, even though that's what everybody else did that stage, I'll ask, can I load? Can I chamber around? Just just ask the ROs. Uh, and, and they'll steer you in the right direction. Um, and that's that's really it. And just check the round count, what you need, what you can't bring. Usually they don't want you to bring a, a steel core or steel jacketed ammo. A lot of foreign, foreign ammo has a, a bimetal jacket. They don't like that just on the steel targets because... It dings them up, but uh, just check the rules. It's it's not too crazy. Um, I should elaborate on the different classes too, because there are it varies at each event. Three gun is mostly the same though, as far as what they offer. There's sure. a there's open, uh, tac optics, and then tactical irons. Those are the big three. Then there's usually a heavy metal. This one didn't have heavy metal this year. Um, but uh, open is basically you could put put whatever you want on your gun. You can have a, a red dot on your pistol, optic on your pistol. Your magazines can be three feet long. Uh, well, probably not that much, but you can have ported barrels. You can have ported barrels on your shotgun. You can have uh, uh, you can load however many rounds into your shotgun tube. So you can say have an X rail and load twenty some shells into it. You can have a Sega. That's all open class stuff. Uh, Tac optics is you can only have one optic. Usually people get a one to four. Um, you can you can't have a magazine longer than a certain length, so you can't have just silly capacity magazines. Um, and then your your muzzle device can't be longer than three inches or bigger than one inch diameter. So they don't want you using those big JP brakes or anything like that. And you also can't use a bipod. So that's tack optics. And that way they just try to level the field. Uh, for your handgun and tack optics and tack irons, uh, you can't have an optic on it. Your magazine has to be 140 millimeters or less. That's like 20 rounds or so for most double stack uh, guns. And then your shotgun, you can't load more than nine shells to begin with, something like that. Uh, and you can't have ported barrels. You can't have detachable magazines on your shotgun or optics. So those are uh, tack optics and... Uh, and open, and then tack irons is just a red dot or iron sights, just a non-magnifying optic. Otherwise, it's usually the same as, as tack optics. Um, Very cool. Well, let's get into uh, talking a little bit about the gear. Okay. Did, did you want to go over with what you shot with? Um, sure. And then we can kind of expand on uh, you know yeah. what, uh, what what kind of gear you might be looking to use, or may, maybe some of the new gear or, or newer stuff you've seen okay. that, that impressed you, Paul? Sure. Um, I'll jump into the rifle first. I brought my rifle in. Uh, grab it here. Uh, this is the one I've used for a few competitions with the same basic setup. And uh, I've always used uh, just a 1-4 to four Vortex. Um, you'll see most people using a 1-4. to four or, well, You'll see a lot of 1-6s to sixes now. Uh, they like that variable power because you fall into tack optics but then you kind of have the benefit of like a one power red dot and a, a decent scope. Um, so that's the the optic there. Um, worked pretty well for me. Um, didn't have any issues. Again, you just got to make sure you know where you're zeroed. I zeroed at 100, and then you want to try and get out to a, a range that goes out to at least 300 so you can figure out your, your point of impact at those various ranges. So if you need to hold over how much uh, and go from there. So you should figure that out because a lot of people s will struggle with trying to just lob rounds uh, on target without ever having shot at that distance. Um, I got a white oak barrel on this. It's always been pretty good to me. Uh, it'll shoot pretty good if I do my part. Um, it's one in seven. I was shooting just 55 grain through it for the close targets, um, but they don't stabilize very well out to like two, 300. I get like a nice basketball size group <laughs> with it. So I shot some, I shot a some ammunition out of it. Um, for those long range targets, and that that did just fine for me. I didn't have any difficulty at all. Um, and then most guys will shoot with uh, some sort of muzzle break, uh, usually with a baffle design like this. You usually don't see too many tactical 
type muzzle devices like flash hiders or uh, even compensators just because they don't reduce the recoil as much because obviously hiding your flash isn't as big a concern in 3-gun. It's really the follow-up shots and keeping on target. Uh, this one here is a Salinger Co. Uh, Saker. Um, and that's that's the brake I used actually this first time, and it worked quite well. Uh, this rifle doesn't move around much. It probably It's probably around 10 pounds, maybe a little more, so it doesn't move much. Um, I got uh, a Battle Arms uh, Ambi Safety. So got that. In case there were any just, you know, uh, barricades that required me to shoot left-handed, there weren't. But some three-gun matches will try and mess with you and have you shoot offhand or in, in awkward shooting positions. Um, I got the Bravo Company uh, charter to handle, just a larger latch, since I'm shooting optics. Um, I do have uh, Magpul backup sights. It doesn't count as another sight, though, since you have to take off your main optic to use it. But I wanted to at least have some option if my optic broke or something. And I didn't want to borrow somebody else's rifle. And I'm, I'm fairly comfortable just shooting irons. Um, I've been silly like that before and shot at matches, and it's fun, but you, you're not going to win matches shooting irons. Um, and I got the uh, newer Geisley uh, rapid fire trigger, uh, that one here. So it's it's uh, basically one of it's the Geisley enhanced rapid fire, I should say, uh, which we now sell. And it's really it doesn't have a it's not a two stage trigger like a lot of Geisley's designs. It's just kind of uh, single stage. It's just kind of a, a rolling trigger, and it'll break uh, fairly quickly, uh, but not too light. Uh, so it kind of has a nice break to it, so you can just keep rolling through those targets. Um, you don't have to, you don't, don't have a long reset and then a second stage to worry about. So those close targets, it's pretty nice, and even at range, it's 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 pretty pretty useful to engage. So most people actually have a setup pretty similar to this: uh, a variable power optic. Um, you don't see crazy long barrels usually. Usually everybody's around 16, 18 inches. And then a, I should say a free float handguard too. I got a Midwest Industries, uh, uh, one of their newer ones, the SS um, Gen 2. And it works great. I like it because it's, it's slim. I can attach a sling if I need to. Most three-gun matches you, don't, you won't need to. Um, so that's pretty handy. But everybody, I, well, I'd say 90% of shooters have a free float handguard. Um, but on the amateur side, people will just bring what they what they have or what they can afford. So you'll see a lot more of those just uh, standard carbine handguards or something like that. But most guys that have shot it for a little while will have a free float handguard. So yeah, it, uh, it's a good looking rifle. Did you say what the kind of lower or lower receiver you oh, have? Oh, I got I got a Rock River Rock River Arms. I've just had this lower. It's been on different configurations. And you'll notice my nice grip there. <laughs> I I like the A1 just because it doesn't have the uh, the A2 uh, bump on it, and it's just it's just a grip I like. There's there's a lot of good grips out there. I have the uh, MOE Plus grip on my other rifle. I like that because of the uh, the rubberized texture. But I kind of just always end up going back to the A1 just because it it handles well for me anyways. Uh, and I get a fairly high grip, and I don't like having uh, much else there. So. It works for me, and then I got an LMT SOT mod, uh, very similar to the the uh, the uh, B5 system SOT mod uh, that we carry. So nice cheek weld on that. Um, a lot of guys now have just the carbine stocks like that, or they have a PRS. Uh, I saw a lot of people at CMMG have the Luth AR, um, and that has the adjustable cheek piece and length of pull. So a lot of guys, especially on the pro side. They like to have it adjusted just right to their body, so they can they can get right in there and, and they got the perfect eye relief, that sort of thing. Um, but really, I I spend enough time with this rifle that I know it good enough. Put it on the right setting and go. <laughs> Don't worry so, about it. So on the rifle side of things, did you see anything there that you thought hmm, maybe maybe you wanted to try out or check out? Um, well, optics, of course. <laughs> Some of the nicer optics. Um, really, a one to six is. I don't know that it's a huge advantage, but those guys obviously had a, a lot easier time engaging those steel targets, especially after these targets get hit from two days of being shot. They're just kind of that gray, you know, <clears throat> lead color. Um, so if you get more magnification, you can see that outline a, a bit easier. 
So that's something I'd probably lean towards getting. Um, you don't see a lot of other platforms or other guns. It's a uh, it's a pretty AR dominated. No, uh, you don't don't point. see any yeah. Formasas or anything. No, um, I shot uh, my AUG at Rock Castle last year, and I think I I told the story last time, and I I had it on the grenade setting the first stage, which was dumb. <laughs> And I had a single shot AUG. I thought about it again this year, but I wanted to try and score as high as I could, so I took what my most the, most accurate rifle. And what about uh, is any bull pups like a Tavor? You see anything like that there? Um, I don't think I saw one. Now I'm only shooting with my squad, so sure. I didn't see a whole lot of other groups. But I don't recall seeing one. I have seen guys shoot SBRs, uh, like ten and a half, eleven and a half inch ARs. Um, and you'll hear the ROs grumbling about them after they leave because they're so loud. <laughs> but uh, no, other than that, where you really see the variety is with the handgun and the shotgun because it's not as standardized as, okay. as they are. Well, well, this was a shotgun-heavy match, so let's talk about uh, sure. shotgun. What did you sure. use this year? Um, I didn't bring it in, but I, I shoot an FN SLP, um, and it's basically already set up for three-gun pretty much. It's got a event rib on it. Um, uh, the capacity is uh, 10 shots. I got a Nordic uh, extension on it. Almost everybody has a Nordic components uh, extension. Um, if you're shooting TAC optics, you want to have basically a 10 shot capacity. You may want more because what a lot of guys will do is they'll load up to division capacity, which is nine rounds, and then as soon as the buzzer goes, they'll just load up more because once the buzzer goes, you can have as many rounds as you want in the gun. Oh, yeah. So huh. that, that capacity is just when you start. So, except for like you can't have other magazines to save for your rifle. That's just a shotgun. Um, so you, they'll load it up and they'll load like 14 in, and then they can engage all 14 of their targets. Where it may have been the intention for the match that you shoot nine targets, then you got to get a reload in there. But with the shotgun, it's all about reloading. Uh, so a lot of guys um, uh, will chamfer out the mag well or the uh, the loading port so it's smoother so they're not cutting up their hands uh, that type of thing. The dominant shotgun uh, it's not like the AR but the dominant shotgun is the Benelli uh, M2. You see that probably 60% of people have that because it cycles fast it cycles with those light loads um, there's a lot of modifications for it um, there's bolt releases, there's of course the extensions it's pretty much standardized at this point. That's kind of the go-to uh, three-gun shotgun. But there were some of uh, the new Berettas, the competition Berettas. Um, I did see a few other SLPs, so it's not like those aren't... It's not like I was the only goofball shooting an SLP. Um, <laughs> what so kind the, of uh, shell holders did you use? I use the AP uh, Industries, or AP Customs uh, shell holders. I have some here. Uh, now I'm sticking with these because this is what I these aren't mine here by I borrowed a coworkers. Um, I use these because I don't know two three years ago this is what I started using. A lot of guys are now using this load too, which I'll get to. Uh, but this is the four by four. It takes four shells in the back. It, it's staggered. It takes four there and four up front. <clears throat> so you can strip out the front front four, load it, and then the back four. So you got eight and a fairly I should, should uh, pull that up. You load the front four, the back four, and then it doesn't take up much space on your belt. It's only the size of a standard, you know, four shell holder um, uh, carrier. Um, I like these just because they're simple, they're rugged. I've never had an issue with them really, um, and I still do the load four method where I pull four shotgun shells and then I load them into the gun with my thumb, um, and that works pretty well with me. Um, are those aluminum? Uh, yep. Okay. Yep. These are aluminum. Uh, the sides here are aluminum. Uh, the backer plate is aluminum. And then they take a blade tech. I don't know if you can see it very well. I'll try not to smack my monitor. Uh, they take a blade tech um, uh, rear uh, attachment. Uh, so that's a tech lock. I'm sorry. That's a tech lock attachment from blade tech. Um, so when I wear them, I just attach them to a riggers belt. I don't have a, a three gun belt like this. So they're just right on my belt, and then I can take them on and off as needed. These uh, tech locks come off pretty easy. You just uh, undo this tab here, and then squeeze the sides, and it's off. So there's the uh, 
Those well, aren't too bad of a price point either. They're around seventy bucks. Yeah, so. you're not going to buy, you know, ten of them, but you only need probably three, um, if that. Uh, so, and they're pretty handy. And I've had mine for oh, probably three years now, and it's it's never given me any grief. And they're nice if you go into the range to practice. You can throw two of these on your belt. You can just reload quite a few times. Yeah, I like I like the looks of those. I'll have to check those out. I'm yeah. in the, I'm in the yeah. market. The only drawback is I'll reposition these if I have to go prone because I'll wear these on my front. Um, oh, if yeah. you have to go prone, it's a big, <laughs> it's a big, you know, box you're laying on. Um, but you may have to deal with it for a few seconds, anyways. Um, and then for the other loaders, people like to use is a load two. I have AP's loader, uh, load two loader here, and this is really what a lot of the good shooters are going towards. Um, or the guys that don't mind spending more money on their on their equipment. Um, so what these guys will do is they'll stack two shotgun shells on top of one another and grab it with one hand. So the two shotgun shells, uh, for your audio listeners, it's not going to be very easy to if they haven't seen this before. But they'll basically hold them in their in their uh, palm like a marker almost, and they'll take that and they'll just shove the first one into the gun and then keep pressing so that the second one just goes in right after it and they'll just follow through with their thumb and press it right into the gun. So you can take two and just load it as if it was one shell almost. Hmm. And a lot of guys are doing that because um, you obviously can cut down on your time uh, basically in half if you do it quick and you do it right. So you can just shove in the two. Um, and there's one, there's another type of loader that uh, people use, which I'm just impressed by. It's called a quad load, and it's very similar. It's just uh, two load two stacked next to each other and people will grab four shells like like that um, just together and they'll shove the first set in like a load two and they'll still hang on to the other two and then load those two right in after it. So they just shove four in right after right after one another. Man, which I'm amazed yeah. I take practice. <laughs> I'd be I'd be dumping shells. I even drop shells with the with the four by four sometimes or the load four. But uh, that's what guys are doing now and the really good shooters, they can, they'll have a shotgun loaded in just no time. It's like, did they even load it, or <laughs> how do how do they have a full shotgun again? Uh, but uh, again, that's what can really make up time uh, with the shotgun. As far as the shotguns themselves, um, you see a lot of just vent ribs usually. You don't see a lot of just uh, you know peep sights or anything like that, because uh, if you have to shoot. Uh, clays, it's it's kind of difficult, and I I was shooting slugs out of my SLP no problems. If you, if you know where you impact with with your vet rib, it, it's not a big deal, um, and they do require that you shoot a certain uh, weight of, of a shot just so you're not beating up their targets. Um, the big no no is don't shoot your slug at like the <laughs> the the close targets or non slug targets because uh, you'll be paying for steel targets if you do that. <laughs> So, uh, what kind of a uh, extension tube do you run? I shoot a, a Nordic components. Okay. On the SLP. Yeah. You probably, probably already said that. Uh, yep. Um, pretty much everybody there was shooting that. Um, if they weren't shooting that, it was because it was factory on the gun. You do see a lot more guns coming from the factory, pretty much set up for three gun. Uh, I got a coworker that shot a Versamax, and that was pretty much ready to go for three gun out of the box. Um, so that's that's pretty handy. Um, really, any extension tube will probably work fine. Uh, I just know Nordic makes a good product, and that's that's what I go with. Yeah, I see. Uh, what Mossberg <clears throat> sells high capacity kits now, and so you you see more yep. mainstream companies doing it too. Now you don't usually see a lot of pump shotguns. Uh, you see pretty much only semi-auto shotguns at three-gun matches. Um, uh, on the amateur side, you'll see some pump guys, or if they're shooting heavy metal, which this match didn't have. Uh, that was one of the classes I forgot to elaborate on, is uh, heavy metal. And that's, you're shooting 308, can't shoot more than a 20-round capacity magazine, has to be iron sights. You have to shoot a 45, single stack, or no more than eight rounds. Then you got to shoot a pump action 12-gauge. So that's, that's heavy metal. Um, I shot heavy metal... Uh, optics at CMMG, and that it was heavy. It was I'm sorry, it's heavy tack optics, 
So I shot my 308 with an optic, and then I could use a 9 millimeter pistol and a semi-auto shotgun. So that was kind of fun. I didn't have to worry about the 45 or the pump shotgun. <laughs> but uh, heavy metal, that's that's tough, uh, especially when the stage designs are so fast, and then you're pumping, and then you're, you got to reload your, your 45. Uh, you'll see quite a few guys shooting 1911s, though. Um, I guess we could dive right into the pistols. Uh, yeah, let's go for it. Uh, you, you do see a few guys still shooting the 1911. I had a coworker shooting over uh, Phil from Sinclair. He he brought his 1911. He was shooting that. Um, uh, you, you'll mostly see Glocks now, though Glocks, and then you'll see a mix. I guess for the 1911, I'd count the STI guns or the double stacks. You'll right. see a fair amount of those because the guys that really put money into it, that's what they go with. Because you got the capacity, you got the accuracy, you got the smooth action, you got a beautiful trigger. So that's what those guys go with. But really the cheap entry-level option, if you get a, a Glock 17, a Glock 34, it's, it's kind of hard to beat that. I shoot a Glock 34, um, which works well for me. I saw, saw a few XDs um, and MMPs. Uh, really a lot, all the modern service pistols, you'll, you'll pretty much see them out there. Um, Outside of that, I I saw one CZ75. Um, I'm sure there were more, but you don't see much variety there either. It's modern service pistols, 1911, double stacks, and that that's really it. That's that's interesting. I'm curious what it's going to be like, uh, you know, three to five years from now, because we've seen a lot of companies come out with, you know, mm -hmm. polymer five-inch competition, you know, length guns. Uh, well, Walther, yeah. FN, um, several several more companies too. I'm not thinking of right now. Yeah, I'm kind of curious to see if like the HK that VP9 catches on because that's a right. service. Uh, the only limiting factor there is the magazines. Your magazine, I think the VP9 only holds 15 rounds, whereas mm. a Glock 17 you got 17, right. and then you can add on all these grip extensions and you can get to like my Glock 34. I have a Excuse me. I have a, a Terran uh, Butler uh, extension, and I could fit 22 rounds in the magazine. You're right. not going to be able to do that with a VP9. You got to fit a reload in there where I can probably shoot all my my pistol targets. Um, the Walther PPQ, I've heard that has a beautiful trigger. Mm -hmm. So it'd be interesting to see how some of these guns, you know, catch on and uh, and pick up steam because there's so much competition now. I'd like to see it. Um, It'd be it'd be neat to see, anyways. I like all the different different guns. Yeah, for sure. So, you see any crazy handguns out there? No, I didn't sh crazy see anybody subject. shooting. I didn't see anybody shooting like an AR pistol. <laughs> You're not allowed to, anyways. But uh, no, nothing that was really bizarre. Um, and you could you'll see guys that are just obviously they shoot pistol competition a lot. Because they'll just they'll be they'll shoot okay on everything the rifle shotgun and then the pistol they just smoke it they'll just have no problem they'll just you know barrel through and not miss um, but no I didn't really see anything uh, particularly odd you usually do see people that paint up their guns like they'll paint them all one color they'll be bright uh, colors that type of thing so you'll see that which is neat um, but no no oddball guns. Uh, I'm thinking myself. I might shoot some older guns coming up. I shoot, might shoot my high power or something like that just for fun, you know. Right. But you, you don't see a lot of that. Um, so what? What's maybe the biggest pistol upgrade people do? Um, probably sights. Uh, sights or triggers. It's probably a toss up there. Um, usually people, most most guys shooting three gun have a fiber optic front at least, if not a fiber optic rears. That's sights are so much on personal preference. I usually see that. <clears throat> uh, for triggers, it's usually some sort of light trigger. 1911, obviously people just do the trigger job or, or do something there. Um, like my Glock, I have a Glock Works trigger in mine. Uh, so usually people don't leave them just stock. Um, for the M&Ps, they'll do the Apex tactical kit, the XD, uh, the Powder River Precision. So that's usually what people do because you're shooting so fast, or you're you're trying to. <laughs> if you can take out any uh, question of you know extra trigger pull or movement in the pistol, you want that gone. Uh, you don't want it too crazy light though, because you are doing a lot of movement, and you don't want to DQ yourself on a stage. Just DQ is disqualification. 
Uh, you don't want to do that on a stage because you had a, a hair trigger. Um, I should mention on the uh, for the pistols, um, almost everybody shoots a holster like this um, with uh, a level, I guess you call it a level 2 retention. I'm kind of not up to speed on my levels of retention here. But uh, it'll be clipped in place by just uh, friction or the, the clip on the on the holster. Um, it, there, you see pretty much everybody shooting a Kydex or a polymer holster. Um, you sometimes see a guy shooting a leather. But if you're running around um, shooting a rifle and shotgun first, you don't want to run the risk of having your pistol flop out of its holster because that's a DQ. And if you had a round chamber, that you're dropping a, a loaded gun and you can get uh, a match DQ. They'll kick you out of the match. Um, so you want to make sure you got a holster that is not going to... that's going to hold your pistol well and it's going to retain it properly. On mine, I have a blade tech. This, this is a blade tech right here. I have a blade tech with the extra level 3 retention with the top strap that goes over just because that's the last thing I want to happen. I'll take the extra second to detach the holster retention and draw it. Um, right. Well, we're going to have links in the show notes for a lot of this gear we talked yeah. about, uh, yeah. links to Brownells, and and so you guys can check it out, especially if you're thinking about getting into uh, competitions like this or you yeah. just want to do some upgrades. Uh, be... and, it, and I'd really just recommend recommend getting out to your range. If, you, if you're if you interested in doing a three-gun competition, get on the forums and look and see what's in your area. But get out and uh, don't just shoot your your rifle off the bench. Shoot it in some other positions, prone, off a barrel or something. Um, shoot your pistol. Shoot some targets. Move. Shoot your pistol. You know, don't just, you know, shoot on the firing line. Now, not everybody has that option of just be flexibility of moving around and shooting. But try to shoot in different positions. Don't always do the same thing when you go to the range. Uh, mix it up, and you'll be a lot better prepared. Uh, I always go back to the rifle. That's that. That's what I I just see the most, uh, anyways. Is just know your zero and how your rifle functions and what you can and can't do with it. Because uh, if you go to the match with confidence in your guns, you you'll do fine. Right, for sure. Yeah, good advice. So, yeah, that about wraps up the main topic. So let's talk a little bit about Duluth Trading Company, a sponsor of this episode. So, uh, Paul, have you seen Duluth Trading Company's ads and stuff? Yeah. I like uh, I like just how they're uh, they're drawn and sketched up. Uh, pretty cool. Yeah, they have really good branding. Really pretty hilarious too. And uh, you know, cold weather setting in, it might be time to start looking uh, for some flannel. And they have uh, their Duluth Trading Company free swinging flannel. I uh, it got a little chilly this week, and I actually broke out the flannel myself. So there you go. It's a uh, really really good quality. Um, you know, it's got uh, the hidden armpit gussets, so you can get that freedom of movement and everything. So it's a pr pretty good stuff. So Duluth Trading Company, free swinging flannel. Check it out, gunguyradio.com slash Duluth. And uh, also, uh, let's talk a little bit about our Patreon campaign. Now, uh, our Patreon, uh, it, it's a way to, uh, you know, you as a listener to, you know, you can pledge. Uh, you know, it's kind of kind of like uh, Kickstarter, but it's more on an episodic level. So you can pledge as little as a dollar per episode, all the way uh, from five to fifteen. And uh, for example, the fifteen dollar uh, level patrons, they get uh, some of this uh, stuff behind me. As Paul can see, there's an avalanche of swag and stuff behind me, and um, Probably get some Brownells hats in there too. What do you yeah, think? gotta do that. So Paul was asking about all my ammo cans behind me, so I gotta I gotta show what the uh, so so two two of the new patrons, the new signups get one of these, but these are from the uh, Duke Cannon uh, Soap Company. So Duke Cannon, big ass brick of soaps. <laughs> there you go. So it's uh you know. Soap that will uh, meet the high standards of hardworking men. You know, a portion of all proceeds of these go to support U.S. veterans. Um, you know, it's uh, again a really cool stuff. They're they're three times 
They, I think they say they're three times the size of feminine uh, bars of soaps. So it's just big, or is it uh, aggressive? It's the aggressive, aggressive soap? big, everything. You okay. know, bigger, better, better. Uh, you know, they have their hunting bricks of soap that you know seeks out and destroys odors, uh, and it also says made in the USA and not made in France. <laughs> so <laughs> they they also have great branding. I think uh, Duluth Trading Company also carries uh, Duke Cannon Supply, but these are their variety packs. So you get one, two, three, four, five different uh, bars of soap like. Uh, this uh, white one that says it smells like productivity. And uh, some of them have steel-cut grains uh, of oats in them, so they really get you clean. What, what are the mili- it's, It says military specs on the side. What are the military specs? Can you read those for me? Oh, it says, uh, inspired by soap used by GIs during the Korean War, tested by active-duty U.S. military, and it's uh, made in the same uh, factory that supplied... Uh, I guess supplies to uh, Korean War troops. Okay. So, yeah, it says in appreciation of the men and women who have kicked ass serving our country, Duke Cannon Supply Company donates a portion of proceeds to veterans' causes. That's cool. Yeah, so very cool. So, uh, you know, all $15 patrons are going to get uh, their hands on one of these, and we're also giving away two to the two newest patrons, which I think we already had two sign up. Uh, within the last week, so pretty cool stuff. And uh, also, just uh, just on board, uh, also our uh, our friends at uh, LA Police Gear have also supplied, as you can see behind me, some of the, the range bags and stuff like that, and tactical lights. But also, just starting this week, gun GunGoddess.com is also supplying uh, $25 gift certificates to the $15 patrons. So gungoddess.com and, you know, women uh, and men can find, you know, concealed carry uh, purses or what do you call that for a man? A purse. A purse. Yeah. I don't know. Is that a satchel? <laughs> a satchel. Well, or just regular holsters and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, concealment. Oh, wait. They have a kilt holster for men, so that might be. Paul, you better put that on your wish list. I uh, I I don't have any uh, I don't have any kilt in me. Uh, I'll pass. <laughs> so yeah, GunGoddess.com Patreon campaign. So very cool stuff going on. And then uh oh yeah, before I forget, so also need to plug our graphic designer Hunter of Design Ryan Cross, and uh, he just um. Or I just got the stickers in for um, all. So this is something all patrons get, dollar level and higher. They get uh, these um, four by four inch, uh, high quality outdoor. Um, where are they PVC? I forget what they're made of, but high quality, fade resistant, uh, wear resistant, weather resistant stickers. So great big stickers and. Uh, so every, everyone that pledges a dollar or more gets um So for Gun Guy Radio, they get the Firearms Radio Network and the Gun Guy Radio sticker. And then for This Week in Guns, they'll get the Firearms Radio Network and their hmm. full auto news This Week in Guns stickers. So I'll have to send you some of these too, Paul. Okay, cool. So... Yeah, that about wraps it up this week. So, you know, please uh, share your thoughts. Uh, bottom of the show notes, gunguyradio.com slash 137 for this episode. If you uh, have any questions for Paul, you can leave them there as well. And uh, also on the YouTube video, comment. Um, remember to subscribe in iTunes. Leave us an iTunes review. And uh, don't forget to shop... Uh, our affiliate links, like Brown Owls, of course, we have affiliate links uh, for Brown Owls and Amazon. So before your next Brown Owls shopping spree, spree just uh, click through our, our affiliate banner. It helps out the show a little bit. And uh, also uh, consider joining the NRA and the Second Amendment Foundation. I'm a member of them both. And uh, they do things uh, you know, collectively that we as individuals just can't do, uh, fighting uh, to retain and expand our gun rights. And uh, check out the other shows on the Firearms Radio Network. And that about wraps it up. So thank you so much, Paul. 
appreciate having you on for a full-blown episode. No problem. It's fun. All right. Well, that's a wrap. We'll see you next week. <laughs>